I've always said that if you wanted to see what's inside something, all you need to do is bump it and see what spills out. I remember uh, when I pastored years ago after the sermon, I'd go out to the parking lot in my car and sometimes just bump the back bumper of a few of our uh, parishioners while they were leaving just to see what would spill out. And sometimes good things and sometimes not really great things. Well, this pandemic, this uh, COVID-19, this has been a big bump for all of us. And for a lot of people, it's bumped out and spilled out some really good things. And for others, and I think for too many, it has spilled out a real, real fear. Uh, You see it all around you. And, And yet there is something that I've been observing over these last, what, four, five, six months that I, I feel is very interesting, and it's this. This pandemic has really caused people to slow down and begin to ask themselves some questions about life. The Apostle Paul, in his last will and testament, this is the last thing he would write, and he writes it to his son of the faith, Timothy, and basically he goes there. He he wants to talk about, as he comes to the end of his life and writes this last letter of 2 Timothy, he basically wants to answer the question, what makes for a significant life? I mean, a life that can be remembered. Uh, it, It bothers me that I cannot remember Much about my grandfather, all my grandparents, well, three of my grandparents died before I was born, and and my grandmother, she died in 1951, and I was only about a year old at the time, so I didn't know my my grandparents, Uh, but I I knew my grandfather's name, Aristide Delahousie, from Louisiana, and and, and then I knew a little bit about my grandfather, my great-grandfather, but that's it. And I, I really wonder what kind of men were these and what was their life really like? And then I start my finding that, you know, really my deepest worry is that, will I live a life that has such meaning that it will be meaningful enough, useful enough to be remembered uh, if from no one else, at least from my own family, my own children, grandchildren, and maybe, who knows, my great-grandchildren. That's the only reason I've written some books and put them in a safe deposit box uh, so that maybe one day they might remember old pops, uh, uh, according to my granddaughter, Sugar, and uh, my grandsons call me pops. When all six are together, they refer to me as Sugar Pops. But other than just the cutesy name, I hope they remember something about my life. Because I want my life print to be something more than a shallow heel mark in, in the mud. So, so during this time that we slow down and we start asking ourselves questions about life, we begin to ask ourselves questions about the meaning of our life, significance of our life. Will there be any remembrance of our life? I mean, have you ever met anyone who said that their life goal is to be useless? <laughs> I don't think so. And, and, and so everybody is trying to live their life in such a way that it's useful in some way. So many people put their hope, it's going to be in sports or education or wealth or music or success. Or maybe just being part of a, a great family. But here again, I want you to open your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter here in chapter 2. And listen to what he tells his son in the faith about living a a, a life. Again, if this world's going to bump you, what's going to spill out? Hopefully meaningful, successful, significant life that's going to be remembered because of the footprint you left. Not just by your own family, but maybe by others as well. And so it all begins with, well... To whom do you belong? How independent do you think you are? Or do you belong to someone else? It's a key to the whole thing. And he says in chapter 2, beginning in verse 19, Paul says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, and having its this seal. What seal? The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. So it begins with the fact, okay, to whom do you belong? What, what do you belong to? And Paul mentions this firm foundation. Now, what is he talking about this firm foundation? The word firm means you can't fall off it. 
It means you will remain standing on it. You are secured. You're safe upon this foundation. So what is this foundation of God? Well, Paul had clarified that in his first letter when he called the church the pillar and support of truth. The church is this foundation. It is his church. And so when he talks about the foundation of God, he's talking about those of us who stand and are secure with assurance in the church. The church that Jesus Christ is building. And this seal that he mentions refers to an ancient practice of placing an inscription on the foundation stone of a building to indicate ownership. And Paul says this seal, this this, uh, this, uh, testimony of ownership that this church belongs to God and you are part of the church so you belong to God. It's a two-fold inscription. Divine and human. The divine proof, he says, is your security that you are a child of God. He says the Lord knows those who are his. And he uses what we call an heiress tense, which means he, he's always known. The most mysterious verse in the Bible has got to be Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, before the world was, before creation, God knew those who would be his own. Those he would elect us, that he would choose to be his own. Those who would respond. And maybe, I don't know, in his omniscience, in his all-knowingness, in the remarkable sovereign mind of God, God looks at the future as the present, and he knows how things are going to turn out. And based on that knowledge, I believe, it says that he, he knew, he's always known you're going to be part of his church. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 6, verse 37 to 40, uh, it's Jesus who says, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. For the prophets say, they shall learn of me, recognize who I am by virtue of the Father in heaven. You, you see, you didn't figure Jesus out. Uh, uh, that's why you have people who are brilliant who believe in Jesus Christ. You have people who are brilliant who don't. You got people who are numbnums who don't believe in Christ and those who, who do. It has nothing to do with how bright you are or how numb-numb you might be, but rather he says, based on the heart that God sees, it is the Father who causes you to recognize that Jesus, this little Jewish rabbi 2,000 years ago, what about five, six, he's God in a bod? I mean, that's the most impossible thing to believe. And yet, it's the Father who caused you to, as Jesus put it, learn of me, recognize who I am. Later in John chapter 10, verse 27 and following, it says that Jesus, the shepherd, he knows and God knows who are his own. And he calls them and he recognizes them and calls them by, by name. And so what Paul does here is very interesting. He says, the first sign of that you are owned by being part of his church is the fact that you have been chosen, that he knows that you are part and you are secured and you're not going to fall out of it. He loses not one of them. But you would miss it here if you weren't really careful in this verse. Because Paul, being a Jewish rabbi, he makes reference, this quote, the, he says, the Lord knows those who are his. That's a direct quote right out of the book of Numbers. And remember, Paul was a scholar when it comes to the Hebrew canon. And it's a quote from Numbers chapter 16. And it's the account of Korah's rebellion against Moses there in the desert. Remember, Moses goes up Mount Sinai to receive the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. He's up there 40 days. When he comes down, they all thought he died. So remember, they have the little golden calf party going on. And that was head up by this Korah. Well, when Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, of course, then he breaks them. And then there's this, this, this remarkable statement where Moses will warn those here in number 16 about those who are part of Israel. So they were part of the chosen people, and yet they rebelled. And it says, the Lord will show you who are his and who are holy and will bring them near to himself. This is what Moses says to warn them. Well, later in that chapter, you might remember, the earth opens up and swallows the Israelites, those who were part of Israel, but those who stood against God, who were basically indifferent because they would not name the name of the Lord as the quote you have here. So the Lord knows those who are his own, and he knows that they will name the name of the Lord. That means surrender to that name. And because he knows they will never surrender 
that should be just the opposite. They will always surrender to the name of the Lord in obedience and honoring their heavenly father and honoring their savior and Lord Jesus Christ. He basically says he will never give up on you. That's the first thing you need to know. You're never going to be abandoned. Maybe it would be abandoned by people on this planet, but never by your heavenly father and never by your Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, that's why Paul writes in Philippians 1, 6, be confident that he who has begun a good work in you will accomplish it until the day of Jesus Christ. So this first uh, seal of proof that you belong to him and you're part of the church, it's divine. It's God made that choice. The second part is of his ownership is he says, let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. Remember your baptism? You remember when they, they put you under and uh, 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 you came out? I used to love doing baptisms because these wonderful sisters in Christ would come with their hairdo. And I mean, they spent, what, a couple hours uh, at the salon getting it just right? And then I had the great privilege of baptizing them, bringing them down. And in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, bringing them up as they look like a wet rat. But, you know, pray for me. I have a weird sense of humor. But remember at your baptism, it was a, your obedience to the first command of Christ. To those who would be in this foundation, in the church. And now he says, as you go into this world, make disciples. And the testimony of one who has become a mathetes, a follower of Christ, part of the church is this declaration they will be baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That phrase, into the name, was actually an economic, a, a commercial phrase for the purchase of something, and it comes under your ownership. In California, where I grew up, when you bought a car, you would get the pink slip. And, and the pink slip was simply that record to show that you, this car, was now under my ownership. That's exactly what you did your baptism. You publicly declared as a disciple of Christ. You were baptized into the name, into the ownership of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so, therefore, your heart was changed when you surrendered to the name of the Lord, believed the gospel, that God loves you, but you've turned your back on him. See, it's the greatest expression of hatred is indifference. And when we live lives that are independent, indifferent from the one who created us, that's what the Bible calls sin. It's a sin unto death, separation from God. And yet God, because he loves us, he provided the provision, his own son, to receive the judgment of God for my sin on himself on that cross 2,000 years ago. And that if I surrender in repentance and just tell the truth, I'm a sinner and I need forgiven. You can't forgive somebody who doesn't believe they've ever done anything wrong. And so how could God apply the sacrifice? How could Jesus apply a sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sin unless you own up that you need that forgiveness? And that's what repentance is all about. And the moment we did that with sincerity, we were given, based on Ezekiel 36, 27, a new heart. Remember, the heart in Hebrew was that center of volition, my, the center of my desires, my thinking, my choices, my volition. And that changed that's why in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Now by this we know, we've come to know Christ. We, tereo is the word, keep his commandments. It's not like, you know, oh man, I have to keep all these rules. Not at all. It's like God's given this deep heart desire that I want to honor God as my father. And therefore I keep, I surrender to the name of his name. I surrender to him. So he says, those who have abstained, uh, that is, those who have come and surrendered uh, to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, the sign that they can be assured is not only what the Father has said, but they abstain from, notice he says, they abstain from unrighteousness or wickedness. So this word wickedness is the word adiakes, and, and it means basically unrighteousness. It's the essence of hypocrisy. See, remember, when you came to Christ, your relationship was changed with God. See, you were born a creature with a creator. But when you came to Jesus Christ, you're no longer a mere creature, you became a child. Remember in John 1.12, as many as believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to them God gave them the authority to become the children of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, 19, remember that the, uh, Paul says, God says, I am your God, but I'll be a father to you and you'll be sons and daughters to me. 
Well, the essence of a heart of a son and a daughter is they have a deep desire to honor their father, especially when their father's been so loving, gracious, and merciful. And, and therefore, who am I? I'm a child of God. I, I'm, I'm a son of God with heavenly father with a deep desire to want to honor my father. Uh, my sisters in Christ, there are daughters with a heavenly father with a deep heart desire to want to honor God as their father. So anytime I do something with any other reason other than wanting to honor God as my father, that is unrighteousness. The word righteousness means right in a right relationship with God as a child to a father. And so therefore, my behavior reflects a desire to honor God as my father. Anytime I do something to simply honor myself or dishonor God, shame him in any way, that's unrighteousness. And here he simply says, because you're a child of God, this, that's hypocrisy. That's pretending to be somebody, uh, the son of the God of this world, Lucifer himself, not the son with a heavenly father whom you desire to honor. Paul says, you are the church. You're in the foundation of truth. And that's proved by the fact of God has sealed you as one of his own by the fact that he's known you would always be one of his own and provide for your salvation and knew that you'd respond to the truth. But then also you have sealed it because you have a desire not to be a hypocrite, not to pretend you're somebody in the world uh, with the same drives and desires that they have, but rather you have been born again, a new birth, a new heart with this new desire to honor God. Well, so if that's who I am and I belong to, to God, well, then how am I going to have a life that is going to be useful to the master? Well, that's what he says as he continues in verse 20. Uh, Paul uses this picture. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, some to honor and some to dishonor. Now, now what Paul does here is he pictures a huge house and his house has many vessels of different sorts, referring to like pots and pans, dishes and eating utensils. And this household is the household of God. It is the foundation. It is the church. In the church, you have all these different kinds of vessels. But Paul here, in his picture, he divides these vessels into two groups. There are those vessels that are gold and silver. And they're used for noble use, special occasions, uh, significant occasions. And then there's those of wood and earthenware they're left in back in the kitchen for common use. They're, they're, they, because they'll break apart and they're fragile, uh, they're not used that much, especially for some special occasion or for something that's going to be important. Well, this house is the church, and the vessels are those who make up the church. If you declare that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you are part of this household. You are part of the church, the foundation of truth. Well, then what's the difference? Why are some vessels useful because they're gold and silver and are used for special tasks to the master, by the master, and then these other ones for common use and primarily to dishonoring the master? So why are some useful and why are some not? Well, look at the text, verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these, he will be a vessel for honor sanctified, here it is, useful to the master, prepared for every good work, every important work, every significant work. He says the difference here of these vessels is that one will cleanse themselves of these. The word cleanse, the word catharsis, we get the word catharsis, it means to purge something out of your life. So those vessels that are going to be silver and gold and are going to be useful to the master are vessels who have purged these out of their life. Now, now what, what's, what's the these? Well, I've always thought, and you would be thinking also that he's talking about this wickedness, uh, this unrighteousness. We need to clean up our act. But the only thing is, uh, as I've studied this and in studied the work of other scholars, I find out for years I've been all wrong on understanding this because there's a closer antecedent. There's something else going on here. This is not about cleaning up your act. Purging yourself of wickedness, that's assumed. He says, if you're really a child of God, you will abstain. Uh, uh, keep yourself from falling into these things. 
What he's talking about here, if you want to be sanctified and prepared to be gold and silver, thus useful to the master, it has more to do with cleaning up who you're acting with. The plural of these, and they sometimes translate these things because it's neuter, but he's talking about these dishonorable vessels, vessels to dishonor. Those who are claiming to be Christians, Jesus talked about wheat and tares in the church. And in those who are claiming to be part of the foundation, but they do not name the name of the Lord. In other words, even though they claim to be part of the church, you don't see them surrendering to the name. You don't see a life of obedience. And again, like Jesus warned, there's going to be those at the end of time who will say, Lord, Lord, we're part of your church. We cast out demons. We did all of these things. And Jesus is going to say, I, I never knew you. I never knew you. See, there are those who are claiming to be Christians, acting like Christians, but they're petrified. You say, petrified of what? They're petrified of the will of God. I mean, so many people, I remember in high school, we think the will of God was to break our legs, make us play the flute. For you dear ladies, God's will for you was for you to never get married, move to Africa, put your hair in a bun, and never have children. And we get this idea that God really wanted to reign on our parade. So most people are fearful of the will of God. But the one who is a child of God is not fearful of honoring the desires of their father. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 12, the first 11 chapters, you, you, you find that all the things God has done for us to bring us into the church, bring us into the foundation of truth, bring us into this household and, and, and then he says in chapter 12, he begins to beg in verses 1 and 2. He says, now I'm begging you, present your body. And again, air is tense. Once and for all, make up your mind and present your body a living sacrifice. Aren't you glad it's living? But a living sacrifice, uh, which is your reasonable act of, the word is latreia, worship. It's the essence of worship is this body, the soma. I give it to, under the name. I surrender it to the name of the Lord. Now, why? He tells you in the next verse that you might prove something. Prove what? Prove that the will of God is not something to be afraid of. But rather, the will of God is perfect, complete, and something beautiful to see. God is looking for those, his own, who will actually manifest living under the will of God, living out the will of God, protecting the will of God in their lives that actually the world will see when somebody lives under the blessing of God. It's something they're going to be drawn to. It's the salt and light that Jesus referred to in Matthew 5. Question is, who do I let influence my life? I need to make a decision on who am I going to conform my life to? Now we say, I want to conform my life to Jesus Christ. Great. Has he had breakfast with you lately? I mean, who is indeed little Christ? Who's reflecting Christ? It's those who are in the church. So remember, Paul made it very, very clear. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, All right, imitate me. The word is mimitase. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Says the same thing in Ephesians 5.1. Paul says, when you follow me, follow me. Imitate me. Act like me and you'll be acting like Christ. You see, Christ is formed in us and he uses other Christians to give us that ability to observe and therefore to become more like Christ. You know, neuroscientists, they've actually discovered in the brain certain kinds of neurons they call mirror neurons. That is part of the way God has designed our brains and created us is that when we see certain things, there's elements in our brain that causes us to imitate. But we have to see certain things to be able to imitate. We cannot imitate that which we cannot see nor have an opportunity to see. And here he's saying, who are you going to be looking at on a regular basis with your mere neurons that's going to cause you to want to be more like Christ? Say, what about unbelievers? Aren't we, aren't we supposed to reach out to those who are unbelievers? Absolutely. At least an unbeliever will admit he's an unbeliever. But remember what Jesus said in John 17. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. I mean, we got to give them something to see. And that means I need to be useful. My life needs to be changing. 
And if my life changing depends on me watching others around me, then I've got to answer the question, who will I let influence my life? Who are my heroes? Who am I pursuing? Who am I watching their lives? Because the opposite's dangerous. Remember Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You're going to be brought down. If all you have around you are hypocrites, vessels of dishonor, vessels indifference to any surrender to the name of Jesus Christ in their home, their behavior, their hobbies, their sports, their economics, their language. See, you will rise or you will fall with them. We will be influenced by each other and those that we pursue as intimate friendships. Solomon put it this way, quote, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Paul says you want to become useful to the master, thus have a meaningful life so that your life is going to be remembered even when you're gone by even those beyond your family. Well, he says, then the choice is, who am I going to let be examples for my life? In 1 Peter chapter 5, the first three verses, Peter says, now as a fellow elder, and he says, let me speak to you elder, shepherd the flock. And when he tells him he's how to shepherd the flock, he says, don't do it for sordid gain. Don't, don't do it to lord it over them. Uh, don't do it under compulsion. You go, Peter, okay, I know how not to do it. How do I do it? And he says just one thing, be examples to the flock. So you go, be examples to the flock. Okay, what's number two? There is no number two. Well, what's number three? There is no number three. There's only one. Because Jesus knows, Peter knows, we're influenced by those we become close to. So how do the words of Paul work here? That we might be sanctified, thus therefore become useful to the master. This word sanctified, hagiadzo, it means to be made holy. It doesn't mean goody two shoes. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't go with girls who do. I mean, my dog doesn't do that. It has nothing to do with this. The word is set apart. When the Bible says God is holy, it basically says God is a cut away from us. He's different from us. Like an artist may paint a beautiful picture, but he never becomes the picture. He's always the artist of the picture. And so God is holy. He's not like us. We have this tendency of idolatry to create God in our own image. And then we worship a God out of our own, you know, imaginations. And, and yet here he says that we're to be holy as, Peter says in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, be holy as your father is holy. It means different from the others. Where the others have no desire to honor God as their father, we do. And this desire to be set apart in that our deep heart desire is to honor God as our father, not to honor ourselves or anyone else, he says, this happens when you are having those people in your life who are vessels of gold and silver, and they're being used for something significant in your life to bring sanctification to you. How do you think it works? You, you read in, in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. So we talk about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Well, these are manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit. Well, well what, what do you do? sit in a closet and feel all these things? Somebody's talking about. He had just talked just prior to a few verses before about walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. These are all relational. And therefore, they will affect me in a relationship. I experience the love and I experience the joy and peace and patience. I experience kindness I experience goodness and faithfulness and gentleness. I experience self-control through you. As I'm with you and the spirit of God in you are manifesting these things relationally to me, my spirit is ministered to. And I get a good look at what Christ looks like, feels like, what the experience of Christ likeness is. And that changes me. And that is part of what he's saying here. Why? We've got to be careful. Who are we going to be pursuing as our close relationships? Who am I going to let influence my life? You see, he says, because if you are therefore changed by the way these silver and gold vessels in the church influence you, he says, well, then you're going to be prepared for every good 
work. The word good means significant, important, high quality of well-being. You know, Psalm 139 that says, David reflecting back, he says, the days are ordained for you have already been established when your mother's womb. I always thought that meant about the length of your life. And it does. The number of days you're going to live, I'm going to live, have already been established when I was in my mother's womb. But it's not just the number of days, it's the days themselves. Every day have, has been ordained. God, that's why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough challenges on its own. So therefore, every day has been ordained by God. And for me to be sanctified, to be affected, influenced by gold and silver vessels who are part of the church. This is why we need the church. This is why we need each other. This is why Hebrews 10.25 says, Don't forsake to gather yourself together, which is the habit of some. But we gather for the purpose of, he says, to stimulate one another unto love and good deeds. We influence each other. So am I going to have the vessels of gold and silver influence me so I become more like Christ? Because God always honors, always uses the greatest likeness to his son. Or am I going to be running around with people who are hypocrites, who, who may name the name of Christ, but you see no surrender to his name in their lives, then, then they will corrupt my, and I, my behavior, and I'll not be useful. So, who do you go around on with a regular basis? By the way, this is why you go to church. Uh, because if anything else, you're going to meet gold and silver vessels in the church. Then go to their classes. Uh, spend some time with them. Uh, hopefully your pastor's at least a gold or a silver vessel. If he's not, you need to go to another church. Because at least on a weekly basis, you can be influenced by at least the one, your pastor. And that's why we gather weekly as often as we can in the church. That's what we're looking forward to, having you come back. Because all you can really do now is respond to what's being said but it's so much better to respond when we can see each other and talk to each other, have conversations with one another. And so it boils down to this. From time to time, God's going to pull out certain vessels, gold and silver vessels, and, and he's going to use them for some very special, important ministry. And if you're hanging around them, just maybe you might get invited along. And thus, this is the word of God. Heavenly Father, I would pray. May we always realize, of course, we reach out with love to anybody around us. People will know we are your disciples, Jesus said, by our love for one another. So Father, this does not stop us from loving anyone. But this is more personal. This is, who are the people that I'm going to let love me dearly? Who will be the people who will become my heroes? Who will be my mentors? Who will I pursue as examples for my Christian life? Lord, who will I learn by watching their lives and experiencing the fruit of the Spirit produced by the Spirit in them, touching my spirit, changing me, sanctifying me, so that my heart has even a deeper yearning to be like Christ. And Lord, like I said, I've seen you always use the greatest likeness to your son. I know I want to be useful to the master. I want my life to count. And during this time of this pandemic, if it has caused me to slow down and reflect on what's important, then I'm even grateful for the COVID-19 and this series, this, this, this season of deed sadness, but sadness moves us to reflect. And Lord, we reflect on you. Lord, I offer this up to you and to my brothers and sisters in Christ as the teaching of the word of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.